I yeah for sure. Uh, first of all, thank thank you everybody for being here and thank you for inviting me. And let me know if you can't hear me well because I'm on AirPods, so the quality might be a bit dodgy. But uh, anywho, I'm an artist originally from Sweden, currently based between Amsterdam and Berlin, here and there, many different travels back and forth. I make a lot of different works and I've been making a lot of different works for the last, let's say, 10, 12 years online and offline from um, just trying to work out how to best summarize my artistic practice. I can like the typical resume bio that I usually use and send around for exhibitions and stuff says that I often set up systems or design like game like structures where I set up a bunch of different parameters and then uh, start initiate the process and then whatever comes out at the end is somehow the art, but also very often. So very often it's quite performative. But performative, not so much in the performance sense, but performative over time. So certain systems and networks play out or perform. Like one of the most uh, well-known exhibitions I did was in 2013, which was called The Fear of Missing Out, where I created an art world database by scraping all the different art world websites uh, and then used this database as uh, input for an algorithm I wrote for an algorithm I wrote to make instructions for how to make uh, successful works of art. So then that is uh, like a quite a long process, but also in a way completely performative because the algorithm performs on top of the big data set of the art world and then gives me instructions. And then I execute the instructions. And as a result of this whole process come, comes artworks basically. So I think that is a pretty typical uh, typical method in how I make work. I've also, since 2018, been running, I can claim sometimes, but maybe I'm not 100% accurate on that. I would I claim it's one of the first uh, tokenized artistic practices, maybe the first, which is called the Jonas Lund token, which is a DAO that uh, like governs my artistic practice in some way. So if you hold Jonas Lund tokens, you get to vote on critical decisions in my artistic career. I can talk more about that later uh, in terms of like the thought process and the motivation for creating that and all this stuff. But I think as a general introduction, maybe that's good. I also made a lot of uh, different types of NFTs, both kind of conceptual and not so conceptual works. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Let me know if that was a reasonable introduction. Jonas, uh, can you hear me okay? Uh, yes, yes. Cool. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Uh, yeah, Daniel also said it in the chat. I think we would love to hear more about the Jonas Loon token. Like, What's your, what was your general thinking around the project and how did you gather your initial community? I've also been curious for a while, like to what extent this project is performative versus real, right? Like, do you actually follow through with the decisions that the community ends up making? And like, what happens if it's, it's an outcome that you're not so interested in? Uh, yeah, for sure. I can talk much more in detail about that. It's, uh, it's, it's, Mm, let's say it is true to the fact that I like uh, follow along with the decisions that happen, but it's also in part performative because I, I'm still the majority shareholder. So I'm like the Mark Zuckerberg equivalent of like the Jonas Lund token universe where I sit on more than 50% of the shares. So, but I, uh, I never participate in any of the votes, but in case of emergencies, I could, right? So it's quite protected. And then in a way, of course, it's similar to many other NFT structures, which are not governed by anything but conventions, you know, that we all agree that this is how they function. Whereas like no smart contract would ever hold up in court, you know, more or less at least. But uh, the origin story of the Jonas Lund token is a couple of different uh, strands of like inquiries. Uh, one of them is more I've been very interested in like decision making processes for a long time or thinking about different models for like a representative democracy in some way. And I think the decentralized autonomous organization structure allows for a lot of different experimentation in terms of this. 
whether you go for like a JPEG Canon's way of distributing votes or you do like quadratic voting or you do like liquid democracy where you delegate delegate experts to vote on your behalf. So all of that, it like the Unison Token provides a platform to explore a bunch of those different things. But the core uh, principle idea is that it's all about like value production in the art world. So the value production structure in the art world is quite let's say hyper hierarchical that the higher up you are in the art world hierarchy the more influence and power you have in determining what's good and what's bad and what's more interesting like what's more relevant and what is not relevant what deserves to be platformed and not and the higher up you are in this hierarchy the more power you have in like pushing through your vision of what is important and what is not and it's uh it's all founded in the institutional theory of art by George Dickey and Arthur Danto, which is art art is whatever the art world says is art. So in order to receive the the designation, in order for an object or a painting or a photograph or an NFT to receive the designation of art, it has to be recognized as such by an institution, which in this case is the art world. And the art world is all the different participants in this like global network, like artists, curators, museum directors, like collectors, auction houses, art writers, journalists, etc. And all of this works in a sort of really uh, super interesting network of approval or network of sort of subjective opinions because there is no way of quantifying the value of art beyond an auction price so everything is sort of subjective but then it's also not as soon as it reaches enough people in the network to be recognized as relevant so in the Jonas Lund token project, it's like the value of the Jonas Lund token is tied into my performance as an artist. As my career improves, so does the value of the Jonas Lund token. And in a way, because of how it works, that art is whatever the art world says is art, if the board members of the Jonas Lund token are representatives of the art world, whatever they say is the truth. So it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy of kind of hedging value production. If I have a bunch of really powerful curators and collectors on my board, and then that they determine that option three in any given vote is the correct decision, just by the fact that they exist and they are representatives of this power dynamic in the art world and they vote for it, it's automatically the truth. So it's like a sort of a, a partially corrupt structure where I hedge the value production in my artistic practice. Or so at least was the basic assumption when I started it in a way. So then to come back to the other question of how I chose the initial board of trustees and how it actually works is that it started like so there's a fixed supply of a hundred thousand which seems quite low but i think that's also makes each individual token more valuable somehow and in the first phase in 2018 i allocated ten thousand tokens to distribute to form the initial like advisory board and then that was a selection of artist friends curators i worked with and then there's some collectors and some other random like art world participants anybody i could think of in my network that has like influence and power in the art world network essentially and then they became the advisory board and then like, as time goes on there's like a quite successful Jonas Loon token bounty program where you get tokens in exchange for typical art world favors like in a very uh, like you scratch my back I scratch yours kind of a corrupt nepotistic way so if I get invited to uh, do a solo show in an institution person who invites me they often the museum director gets token and uh, tokens in exchange so slowly over the years there's more and more people from the art world networks that enter into that gets like platformed into the UNS token universe, essentially. I think that is like the broad intro to the work. Maybe that I hope that's quite clear. If there's more follow up questions in regards to that, perhaps.
Maybe I'll ask a follow-up question. I would be curious to hear uh, whether like the NFT boom of two years ago last year influenced this project in particular, but like also your practice at large. Like you've been working uh, in the blockchain and with the blockchain and doing work about the blockchain for like quite quite some years now. And like I would just be curious to to understand a little bit how these past two or three years uh, just influenced your thinking around it. Uh, I think in a way, yeah, I mean, yes and no in some way, like with the Jonas Lund token project that for anybody had experience like organizing, structuring communities or setting up DAOs is that it's a ton of work, like continuous ongoing work that is somehow not very visible very often. So in the case with the Jonas Lund token, I always feel like there's so much unrealized potential with this work because I have so many other things to do all the time that I don't, I never have enough time to dedicate just straight up to the Jonas Lund token project because there are so many aspects of it that hasn't really been explored fully. And I would really like to pivot it into becoming much more of a financialized incentive structure to go into like really go hard into like a DeFi pro crypto scenario where everything becomes gamified and everything becomes of like straight up uh, sort of partially corrupt incentives. Maybe it's like turning it into like a mini FTX and then it can all collapse and then it just blows up beautifully and then it's kind of over. So it reaches a sort of uh, uh, the circle complete version of like a crypto utopia that <laughs> just falls apart. Uh, that would be really nice. I think uh, in general, that is like the challenge with the Jonas Lund token project because within like the, let's say the NFT boom, the JLT could have like capitalized a lot more on that and like really drive it and really start from the beginning, essentially just try and platform everything and just incorporate everything into it. Hasn't really done that much. There hasn't been many Jonas Lund token NFT projects either. And I think uh, there certainly should be. It's again, just a question of time because I think even before, I mean, I think that's also some reflection on the NFT space in general, because for sure, I was interested in uh, like blockchain technology. And I think the reason why Jonas Lund token is uh, ERC20 token is because it was the best technology for the purpose of distributing shares at the time. And then you also engage with all the different politics that come with crypto and blockchain. But in some way, uh, there's like for sure. So since the NFT boom, Let's say I've done a lot of different NFT projects because it's also super interesting to reflect upon what it does to all these different aspects of value production, of artistic production in general, and how much the network grows. There are so many new players in this uh, scene compared to so like basically messing up a sort of deeply established structure, which is the traditional art world and like pushes the boundaries a bit. And it's of course, super interesting to engage with that and think about new possibilities or new means of distributing work and new means of making conceptual work that's not really possible before or possible, but not as simple or not that structured. But at the same time, having like a, for lack of a better word, like a, a artistic career in an established art world also means that there's like, a lot more, let's say, time pressure for everything. Because if you go deep into NFT space, you don't necessarily have much time left over for managing like physical work production or like doing physical shows. And then, so it's like, uh, for sure, it's, it's in some way almost doubled the workload, but that's of course also my choice because I really enjoy exploring these things. So I think, uh, it's, it's a bit of a challenge. I think with the Jonas Lund token project is the one that frustrates me the most because I wish I just had more time to to like really explore it further. But I think that's also, it will be part of a show in, in Basel in June, which is the next step where I want to like really uh, pivot, as they say in the startup world, you pivot to something, you know, something a bit more extreme. But then at the same time, they also further challenge, and I will just keep on uh, blurring until someone interrupts me, is that if once you have a project that's been running for five years, 
it becomes harder to disrupt it because there is some sort of inherent value in keeping a status quo somehow. You'd be like, okay, so it exists there. So because if I would pivot it really harshly to something, it's no way of going back. You know? So then I have to be quite sure exactly how it should be pivoted or not. But I think uh, that has to happen. Like something has to happen with it where it becomes a bit more extreme. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe ask one more question if that's okay. Uh, yeah, go so you, yeah, you recently had the work uh, collected by the Pompidou, is that right? I, that's right, yeah. Yeah, congratulations. Uh, and yeah, I was curious if you could tell us a little bit about that project in particular and like how the Pompidou became interested in it and like what the entire process was like and like. What does it even mean for such a large institution to to collect one of your pieces? Yeah, for sure. I will tell you. So the uh, project is called it's called Smart Burn Contract, and it started in two thousand twenty one, which is a series of. Let me post the link in the chat. It's a series of NFTs that have like a contract on them, or like written. It's text based work that says, for example. The owner of this NFT must donate 5% of the yearly profits to a charitable cause once a year in perpetuity, or the owner of this NFT must go on vacation for two weeks once a year in perpetuity. And then, so basically it's a custom smart contract where I have expanded the burn function, like the ERC721 contract standard has a burn function in them. So, but only the owner can burn the NFTs. So all the NFTs you have in your Ethereum wallet, you can destroy them by just hitting a burn function. Uh, so the smart burn contract has rewritten this burn function. So also the contract owner, i.e. me, can burn the NFTs. So I can remote destroy them, essentially. If people don't honor the, er the terms on the piece, I will just destroy them. So in a way, it's like a, it's, it's similar to previous works I've done, which is like, a, for example, a work called Strings Attached, which was similar. Uh, let me just pull up the link, which was a physical painting series, with, which also had terms of sales on them. Like, for example, this painting may never be offered at auction. This painting may not be resold until after March 21, 2025, etc. Uh, so... Uh, whereas with those paintings, the way to remote destroy the work was to de-authenticate them. Basically, I would announce that I no longer recognize this painting as a work of myself and make the certificate of authenticity void, which any artist can do at any time for any work they've ever made. You know, you're just like disassociate yourself. But that's not as powerful as with the smart burn contract where I can just destroy the work. It's it basically, it's like when you burn an NFT, you just send send it to the null address, right? Like zero, zero X, zero, 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 zero. Uh, and then it just ceases to exist. It's gone. There's not even a trace left of the image or anything. And on OpenSea, for example, you burn the NFT, just it's gone. So in a way, it's like you really destroy it. And since the, since the Pompidou, I mean, that work was also made as a reaction towards like some hyper hype mechanism in the NFT space where I wanted to make a series of works that are quite difficult to collect, that come with some type of obligation, that comes with something you actually have to do. And if you don't do it, the work ceases to exist. It's like the opposite of something that's easy to collect and easy to flip and easy to just buy, buy, buy and sell, sell, sell. So it's kind of like a making it more difficult. I think for me, what I really enjoy about this process is because since the Pompidou, that uh, series picked up, there will always be 21 pieces. So there will only be new ones if some one of them gets destroyed. And right now there are, most of them have been placed into different collections. There are, since the Pompidou acquisition, that was like, it picked up a bit. So a bunch more have been like sold to people. So I get I just received like proof from one of one a Norwegian guy who got um, 
the one which let me just pull up and see exactly what it says it's like uh the owner of this nft may do must do an act of kindness once a week for a year so he will send me he, like he sends me updates every week with proof that he's done an act of kindness which is really sweet you know it's like so it's also this is my favorite aspect of this work is that it actually makes uh, relationships between me and the collector it's really like a very direct one-to-one -one sort of uh, exchange you know so then in a way coming back to this performative aspect of my practice this is a, like an ongoing performative contractual exchange so in a way to maintain this nft you have to like uh, like <laughs> really like do things the owner of uh, the nft that says the owner of this nft must go on vacation for two weeks once a year in perpetuity she sends me pictures from the vacations you know they're like hey look i'm on vacation this is the proof and there are a couple more now that are quite difficult i airdropped the owner of this nft must plant one million trees within two years from the date of purchase to stevie so let's see that's a christmas gift so we can see if he like uh, uh if he does it but so in the case of Pompidou, they got the piece called Hoarder, which says the owner of this NFT may not sell any works from their collection continuously in perpetuity. So the Pompidou may no longer sell any works from their collection, which I think is like in terms of sort of statement pieces, it's super nice because it's a very common talking point from the right wing politicians in France that Pompidou should be self funded because it's a like a, a tax funded uh, museum right they receive money from the state and from the city of paris but then they claim that pompidou should be self-funded because they have a huge collection and all they would have to do, like including some very expensive works from duchamp from warhol from picasso you know so they could be easily self-sustainable by just selling a couple of pieces from their collection and then that would fund the museum's business but now they may not so every time that talking point comes up they can just refer to this piece that they are contractually obliged not to sell any works from their collection so that's really nice uh in terms of uh what it means to be collected by a institution like pompidou it's uh, funny because this is actually the second piece of mine that they collect and it's not the first one but because they bought a website work from 20 12 like uh, early last year so in a way but uh, which is funny because that was not announced so no one knew about that but in this case with the nft news it's a very public affair which is nice i think uh, a large part of being an artist is somehow i think of it like from this point of view like a lot of artists i talk to and a lot of the reason for making work is to overcome the fear of dying and being forgotten like you turn into sort of a irrelevant and uh, no one that never existed and then two generations on no one remembers you even existed in the first place so a lot of the like desire to make stuff i mean not actively i don't ever think about this actively but there is something in that idea that a lot of like artistic production comes from some desire to be remembered or to make leave a mark on the world and in a way like when it comes to art it's like the end destination for art is the museum like if the your artworks end up in the museum you know it's like okay that's it it will never leave this is like where it, both art goes to die but art goes to enter into the permanent archive the record of like art history so from that point of view, of course, it's like it's super nice to enter into such important museum collections because they are also now on the hook to care for this work, you know, to ensure that it stays online, to ensure that it stays alive, to like manage the logistics of the artwork. And it's a huge administrative burden for all the museums to manage and ensure that their collection doesn't decay that you i mean there are uh, hundreds of people who are just restoring like to are overseeing you know like the right i mean for the physical works in the collection the right climates the right humidity the right storage the right management all of these things so it's really like an, a, a huge operation so to enter into that uh, atmosphere like to enter into that history of course it's uh, super nice and it's also very nice to do it with such a like a conceptual work in a way like that's uh, yeah it, it's uh, super nice yeah. <laughs> yeah.
That was a long answer. Pull a lot. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. But see, there's no other questions because it's all so clear. There are also so much documentation about all my talks everywhere online. I think uh, in general, if there's no more specific questions, I you can also, I can ask you questions, basically. Maybe, uh, so this is like the vertical crypto residency. How long does the residency go on for? I can answer these questions. So. Um, yeah. The residency is a 12-week program. It's an, it's entirely virtual. It's held in the Discord room that we are re right now. And the first nine, ten weeks of the residency are dedicated to classes and workshops and AMAs, like the one that we are at mm -hmm. right now. And the last two, three weeks are dedicated to creating an artwork, which we then exhibit at an exhibition in the metaverse. The metaverse is something that the residents built themselves with the assistance of um, alumni and uh, other people who who help us out in this. And it's also related to an auction event, which is not mandatory. Um, that's basically the shape and structure. Nice. And this is the fifth uh, residency? This yes, is this is the fifth cohort. Yeah. Uh, no. Personally, no. I am a resident from the second cohort, and uh, um, I'm, I can speak from both sides of the experiences. For the second cohort, I was a resident. For the third, I was just a mentor. And for since the fourth, um, I've actually become the manager of the residency. And uh, nice. we're actually that's how you make career in vertical crypto, guys. <laughs> so you go to the season two resident node, now season five, and then you go. So in the cohort number 10, you can all be PM, so vertical crypto, essentially. Well, actually, uh, I wanted to, to, to let everyone know that um, after the residency concludes, you can uh, opt in to being mentors for, for the next cohorts. Um, all of all of you are incredible artists and people, and uh, your um, knowledge base can be absolutely useful for other artists as well. So, if you think about it, and if you wish to be mentors, just I will reach out after the end of the residency, and I will ask anyone if they want to join. Nice, not bad. Yeah, very good. And also, just so you know. Um, we're actually going to be next week on Tuesday or Wednesday, we're going to be opening up the open call for the applications for the next cohort. So if you have friends that are excited about this or wish to um, share the news with anyone, just be on the lookout and uh, we will be posting about this next week. Usually the open code lasts for about two to three weeks. So that's plenty of time for people to um, to get their information together and to apply. The form that, that, that you have to fill out when you apply, as you know, because you already did that, apart from Jonas here, uh, is very simple and it's, um, it's, it's very friendly. It's not something that gives you the impression that it's going to take a, an arm and a limb to participate. So just wanted to give you a heads up on that. Any other questions? Go for it, Daniel. So Jonas, this is one for you. Should I read it out loud or are you? No, it's okay. I see it. I'm just, awesome. just typing a message. Yeah, it's a, 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 I mean, it depends on your DAO. Like my DAO takes a lot of time and effort because it's a, like, it's called the DAO, which stands for Decentralized Autonomous Organization. I think the accurate description of Jonas Lundhagen will be a, a centralized 
uh, labor intensive organization because it's centered around me. So basically it's a one man operation. I do everything, you know, it's like a program, the whole website program, the smart contract, do all the proposals, do all the emails, run the discord. Like there is no one else. There's been some people who asked me if I needed help, like, and some people offered to be like, uh, whatever, like community managers and stuff in Discord and, and also running the Unas Loon Token Bounty program because there's a lot of requests for that always, all the time. Uh, which I never had time to even structure the setup so much that it could allow for another person to do it because uh, everything is somehow centered around me. So yeah, there's, uh, I think that's, I think many people struggle with this. I, like, I mean, I have many conversations with people around DAOs in general, that uh, even so, even if it works, like even if you have like a good thing, it's the biggest challenge is like, how do you incentivize participation beyond any type of financial uh, speculation? Because in the case of the Unas Loon token, it's quite... Uh, complicated in a way because what is actually the incentive to participate beyond being then part of like an art project and becoming like part of the documentation and a couple of my friends have mentioned that it's quite like it's like instrumentalizing friendships in some way because i'm asking people to participate whereas they get not so much in return so i think that's one of the core issues with a lot of dance is that how do you actually incentivize uh, things in somehow I think the most successful DAOs, and if you think of like friends with benefits, for example, or other ones, is the ones that come together for a shared purpose in a way. So then the uh, organization and activation happens more organically, and then it's more uh, grassroots from the ground up instead of from top down. And the honest token one is more, it's a, it's a complicated one. Uh, and I really, really the uh, the way it suffers is that I don't spend enough time on it. So then it also becomes less active and then it like never takes off. So I think in that sense, it, that's where the pivot needs to come in, where it becomes more, more like accelerated in some sense, you know, like you can just really try and accelerate it to, to somewhere else. So if you have any ideas for how to do that, I'm like super eager to hear. <laughs> It's like a question. How can you like increase the financialization of it? Like, in a way it's like, so you can do like what Blur does. You just airdrop more tokens and then make marketplace where you buy and sell the tokens and then it becomes like something else. But that sounds more like a pump and dump scheme to me than anything. And then it's just like, once it's pumped and dumped, that's it. Then it also just collapses. So I think uh, uh, it's, it's a bit of a challenge, but. I mean, on the other hand, it also gives a lot of different things, you know, it's like, it's a very fun project to do and it's been exhibited many times in many different shapes and forms. And I, uh, that's nice. Yeah. 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 Are there any other questions? Don't be shy. It must mean that uh, my artistic practice and work is so clear that it doesn't ask many questions. That's quite good, yeah. But I also think it's not so easy. I mean, it's uh, maybe it depends on um, the typical uh, AMAs also, because it's more. Many of my works is sort of, in some sense, also quite self-explanatory, and then it's more about the outcome of the work in some way. But I think, but yeah, I'm not sure. It really depends in a way like where you find the entry points or like where the questions come. I think, 
in in general maybe it's not so easy but it's good to to think about like what are good questions in general in pretty much all contexts because one learns a lot I have yeah, to say I, this I, is a tricky one. Yeah. Sorry, I interrupted. I have to say you. I really love your website, but let's answer the question. <laughs> How important I find marketing Twitter so that both to be in terms of success. I mean, I think it's quite complicated in general. It's like so. As an artist, you're expected to make the work, to contextualize the work, to write about the work to PR the work and to promo the work. And then it's like five job descriptions in one where actually all you want to do is just make the work. I think Twitter for sure in this NFT space has become incredibly important for good and bad, like both good and bad sort of uh, positions because not every, not all works like function in that format, you know, not all works. It's like suitable for a twitter format so what twitter does like in that way is really optimizing for a very particular type of work and i think that is uh not without its own complications i think i think i'm i mean i'm lucky in the way that i don't have to rely too much on any on twitter for like uh, communicating my work in some way uh, although I'm sure I could have like much more success in certain aspects of my career, like in certain like NFT drop versions of careers by doing like, by focusing a lot more on Twitter. I just don't want to, I just don't do that because I just don't want to. <laughs> it's just like, a, it's a choice in a way. I think it's an interesting observation from Brad Trammell. He did like an NFT report. Was it like two years ago? Yeah, two years ago. Whereas like in the traditional art world, it's the setup, it's like artists make the work, galleries, dealers sell the work, collectors buy the work and the museum validates the work. So the, the museum is the place where the work goes to get like a stamp of approval for its value being correct. Right? And then all the collectors are super happy because the collectors are on all the boards of all the museums. So they just promote the work they collect to enter into the museum collections. This is quite corrupt. Brad Jermel's observation in that space is that uh, in the last couple of years, there has been like a shift in the validation process where it's no longer really the museums that validate, although they do, but they do less because they've been destroying their own credibility by staging really stupid exhibitions and by being like quite openly corrupt, like they stage, you know, Banksy and Koss exhibitions and Björk exhibitions and sneaker exhibitions, etc. And Brad's claim is that it's uh, uh, is like that validation process is moving from the museum to fans. So fans are the ones that validate everything. So fans are the ones that sort of approve the content to make, to like prove that it's valuable. And I think that is super true in the NFT space. That's like the more uh, followers or the more social capital you get, the more that converts into actual capital from NFT releases and, uh, and stuff. And I think that is quite problematic in the sense that that is for sure not uh, highlighting and promoting the works that are the most uh, relevant, let's say. And it's like then it comes back to a popularity contest in some sense, which I overall find quite complicated. But maybe it's also like, I mean, it's complicated, but maybe in some ways it's more fair of an evaluation process compared to like a very elitist hierarchical power structure, which is the art world. Maybe it's more fair that the people decide what is like relevant and valuable as opposed to like uh, professional professionals in a museum board. But there is something that happens with, uh, I mean, first of all, Twitter is not really like a forum for in-depth conversations about anything. And it always very quickly spirals into nonsense or just like uh, trolling or uh, things. So... I don't know. It's complicated. Yeah. I think in some aspects it's quite, I mean, I think when you're starting out Twitter and Insta, I mean, Instagram, I don't know if anybody is on Instagram anymore. It doesn't feel like, 
and that also it's becoming the long-term complications with this is as all social media platforms twitter and instagram in particular are switching to like the algorithmic feed where there's no longer chronological display of everything you see is that then your popularity or your success as an artist is so not in your control then it's just about like uh, trying to game the instagram and twitter algorithm which for sure does not optimize for the best uh, like for the like greatest quality or anything it optimizes for a very specific specific you know type of work and i think that is quite problematic in the end uh, as a sort of direct experience of uh, using this type of marketing for your career it can be very disheartening and very complicated because there is no real way of telling why certain tweets or certain works perform better than others so then like what do you how do you even then quantify what works and what doesn't and then how do you determine what you like to make because in some way what you like to make should be what you like to make regardless of what other people think about it but at the same time you also need to make work that uh an audience responds to so then it's a there's a very complicated equation of how you manage and navigate that what i usually say in the end which is true if one chooses to believe in it is that the quality of your work is much more important than the quality of your network because it's much nicer to think like that it's like much nicer to be like yeah okay so because the one thing you can control and the other you can't really control you can try and like improve your network and improve your twitter game and your instagram game and all these things but that's not a very like rewarding endeavor where it's like to try and make the best work you possibly can it's a much nicer long-term investment for yourself and then long term i really believe that the quality of your work is like what really matters you know because many artists are like you know like art world successful are not on social media at all you know but then maybe they come from a different generation or a different sphere so it's complicated i would say but i think as my resolve in that is to decide for myself that i care much more about the quality of my work as opposed to the quality of my network but that's also coming from a position where I already have like a career. So it's also not exactly fair to say this. And it certainly comes from some position of uh, privilege in a way, because I don't have to rely on it. Although for sure, for doing like NFT drops, for sure, Twitter is super important. Now. Any related question before or like was there a before uh period of your art career uh that that was like maybe different from the type of conceptual work that you're doing right now or like did you start being an artist by making this type of work and then you kept going with it uh, that's a good question yeah so i i finished i did my bachelor i mean i graduated from my bachelor in 2009 and I started photography. And then I did like photography work, but the photography work was all kind of like meta photography work, like photography work on photography or photography work on like copies and all these different things. So it was always kind of like that way. It's a bit like cheeky trying to play tricks or trying to navigate some type of rule structure or have systems to in some way overcome the struggle of justifying the existence of the work because there's something there you know there's more than just like the the inclination to say i'm an artist and then here's my work you know which in many cases is enough you don't need to justify making work at all but i always felt i had like a strong need to justify making work and then that justification happened by by like making the work about something or like having it do something and then it's like a specific thing and then i would have answers to questions like yeah but why is it like this i'd be like yeah but then in the end no one asks you why is it like this so it's, it's like fine but yeah i mean there's like i started making online work like in 2010 2011 and it was all kind of like already uh like early versions of the work i make today 
You know, when it's funny because I think most artist careers are founded in like one, two good ideas. And that's it. That's all you need. It's like one, two good ideas. And then you just explore those ideas in so many different shapes and forms. And then that's like, because it's not so much. Of, I mean, I also really don't think it's much of, so much about being original because I think originality is wildly uh, overrated in this world because it's more... It's more like figuring out the best way that works for you in some sense. So what is kind of like, what what are the new conversations or new points of view one can add to this conversation in some way? And I think in a way, like I often talk about this, like art definition of art, what is art and what is not art. But actually that's also quite irrelevant because it's not so much what is and what is an art. It's much more like what the art does or doesn't do which is much more interesting to think about, I think, in general. Yeah, there's a lot of talking. It's almost six o'clock, so that's good. I think it's time for maybe the last question. Second to last question, short question, long question, can be any type of question. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Um, Have a question while well, you think i can i can promo my latest exhibition which closes on sunday called in the middle of nowhere which is at office in part in berlin if you are in berlin you should go have a look at it it's an exhibition made in collaboration with chachi pt which uh, uh, is very strange it's a very strange exhibition so have a look at that one if you're in berlin last two days tomorrow and sunday or maybe it's actually last day is tomorrow. No, last day is today. Ooh la la. Time is a weird concept, yeah. right? Yeah, indeed. I have one last indeed. question for you. Yeah. Have you ever experienced any kind of trouble or um, any weirdness? when because i see that your work is uh, as much as it's digital there are also physical works from the ones that you do yeah have you ever experienced yeah. some backlash against um some of the work you do in the traditional art world and whenever you've approached galleries to present an installation is there any kind of preference over uh, over one over the other no like uh, no, uh, uh, I don't think so. Uh, I really don't think so. I have to think, see if I received any backlash. Not really. Um, Fantastic. No, I think that's. I wouldn't say so. I think it's like uh, it's really. I mean, now let's say the understanding that like digital art can be sold is like much higher, but then for sure, I think I, like I sold my first like purely digital work in like 2014 or something like a website. So then I think it's always been like, that was like the proto way, proto NFTs, you know, like you sold single domain name websites as work. That was already like a market there. And then you can sell like video work, which you just send on a USB stick. You know, it's like very similar to like NFTs in some sense. Although it's like, I mean, NFTs in a, in a way is like the ultimate art asset because it's like you can trade it and you can speculate on it, but you don't have to ever deal with any type of storage. But I never received any real like uh, contention from from anything. I mean, but it's also mostly because because uh, you do like, uh, I mean, like you get invited to do exhibitions from people who like your work and then they are also super willing to work with you and figuring out like what is the best best way to make you know, the installations or physical work or digital work and stuff like that. So I don't think, I don't think that's very common either, to be honest. The one re would receive like a backlash from this, but maybe I'm wrong on that. Wonderful, thanks so much for answering. With that said, we have just five minutes before the the time, and I would like to ask everyone for another question, but I don't know if there is enough time for that. If someone has a very quick question, maybe?
If not, um, thank you so much, Jonas, for taking the time to answer our questions. And uh, yeah, for sure. Also, I uh, last point is if you come up with other questions later, you can just write me on Discord or whatever. I'm in the vertical crypto. You can also join the Jonas Learn Token Discord. Let me self promo, and you can follow me on Twitter, wherever. It's like <laughs> I see. Yeah, you, it's like. Uh, could you drop a, um, a the, link for us to, yeah. the, to your Discord? Yeah, for sure. I'm just trying to find the voice channel there. Yeah, there. Awesome! Thank you so much um, again, and uh, have yeah, a wonderful yeah, sure. weekend. Yeah. And good luck with yeah, likewise. the exhibition. Bye. Thank you so much. This is wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Ciao. Bye.